Welcome, everyone. So this is a, uh, a really important topic tonight uh, that we'll be covering. So our, our panelists tonight will, will talk about their experiences and their views on physician-assisted dying. So it's, it's a serious and, and very important topic. This panel discussion is sponsored, co-sponsored, really, by the Utah State College of Science and Utah Public Radio. And, uh, and we are really proud for, for both organizations to support sharing important ideas on important topics. And this certainly is such a topic that we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, before I introduce the panelists, let me introduce myself. My name's Greg Podgorski. I'm Associate Dean in the College of Science. One of the things I do are related talks, Science Unwrapped, but this is not a Science Unwrapped talk tonight. Um, with this topic, it's, it's certainly important, it's also controversial. And I want to say at the outset that the views expressed tonight are those of the panelists and not views necessarily shared by the Utah State College of Science or UPR. Um, tonight, the way we'll run things is actually we'll let the panelists run things. I know Dr. Anderson, who I'll introduce in just a second, uh, has a prepared presentation. Our other panelists will certainly have words to say about their experiences and views, but there'll be a lot of give and take between the panelists. What I'd like you in the audience to do tonight is to submit questions as they come up okay, through the Ask a Question feature that you'll see in the upper right-hand corner of your AggieCast screen. So as questions come up, submit them, and I will uh, later on in the presentation look through the questions and then get those questions to our panelists. So, so ask away. We'll go tonight no later than quarter after eight, but we'll see how the questions go and we'll, we'll just take things from there. One thing I want to call your attention to, and I think Dr. Anderson will, will do the same in his presentation, is the panelists ask you to view a film, so a documentary film, ahead of the presentation. If you haven't viewed that film yet, uh, you know, it's okay. This is, is not graded homework. Okay. You've got a chance to view it afterwards. And that film if, is called, let me just make sure I've got the, uh, the right name for it. It's, it's How to Die in Oregon. So it's a documentary about the uh, Oregon Death with Dignity Act of 1994. So it, it's, a, it's an excellent film, definitely worth a, a view. And the link to that film is present on the College of Science website that describes tonight's presentation. So, so make sure you get a chance to view that film if you haven't done so already. And what I'm going to do is turn to our panelists now. And it really is an honor and a privilege to, to introduce each of you. I know one of you very well, but I'm going to start with someone who I met for the first time tonight, Dr. Matt Welter. And Matt is a board-certified family practice physician and also a hospice director. And as I understand it, Matt, you have uh, been practicing medicine in Logan for 16 years. Yes. And you have been a hospice director for 20. Yes, because I, I was in Wisconsin before coming here, and uh. I was a hospice director there, too. So I've really been doing it uh. pretty much my whole medical career. So. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, and then Andy Anderson, who I, and Andy I've known for many years. And Andy is a lecturer in the Department of Biology. Andy uh, has, has taught courses and continues to teach courses in anatomy, physiology, and especially important for tonight, uh, bioethics. So yes. Andy's a deep interest in bioethics, and I think Andy will share that uh, with, with us tonight. And that's not an exhaustive list of courses that Andy's taught. Uh, Pat <laughs> Sadowski is, I know you've got a BSN, Pat. Do you have an RN as well? Yes an RN, BSN, and master's degrees Correct. in both cardiac rehabilitation and in, I'm going to cheat over here, cardiac rehabilitation, and it's, it's some form of exercise science. Maybe you can tell us yes. exercise science, okay? Importantly for tonight, okay, Pat has, has practiced nursing in a lot of fields, but she found her passion in hospice nursing, and she has practiced hospice nursing for close to 25 years. Correct. Correct. Good. So again, I, I want to thank you, Matt, Andy, and Pat. And what I'm going to do is I will shift out of the way. 
I'm going to actually act uh, as Andy's facilitator, advancing slides initially, but I'll slide even further out of the way uh, until uh, <laughs> you know the panelists have finished with their presentations and discussions, and, and then we'll have a question and answer period. So thank you, everybody, and I really look forward to your talk. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Greg, for being here tonight, too. You're very welcome. So, Andy, take it So uh, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to start off with some uh, PowerPoint presentations, which we'll go through fairly quickly, that kind of demonstrate some of the things we're going to talk about, some of the terms that are important, and some of the uh, statistics uh, from Oregon, that is the state that has been dealing with this the, the longest. So let's go to our, our first slide here, our first slide. So again, this is just the identification of who we are. And uh, all of us uh, have known each other for many years. And the discussion of death and dying has come up uh, quite often in the conversations that we've had. So when the opportunity came to discuss this, they were the very logical people who know more, much more about this than I do, and you'll hear uh, what they have to say this evening as well. Go to our next slide, please. So uh, Greg mentioned the uh, How to Die in Oregon, and I actually watched it again today. I watched it several years ago, and I watched it again today, and it had just as much impact on me this time as it did previously. There are various cases that you can see, almost as part of their family, how they are dealing with these very challenging issues and the choices that the people made. So it's a very educational movie that you can watch at the link that Greg gave you, either already have or in the future. And I highly recommend you do so. Next slide, please. This just reiterates what uh, Greg said, that uh, these opinions are our own, and each of the three of us have strong opinions on this subject, as you'll hear this evening. Next slide, please. Now here we get to the terms that I was talking to you about. One of the things in ethics, and as Greg said, I do teach a class in ethics, is you have to define the terms to give the parameters for the argument that you're having. A lot of people mix terms around, which can be very confusing. So let's start off with the word euthanasia. Euthanasia usually means the killing of one person by another uh, for merciful reasons. And this is illegal in the United States. You can't do mercy killing in the United States. Now, it is legal in some European countries, including Holland, which is quite famous for this. Uh, the people in Holland seem to feel they're on the right course on that one, but that's a different subject for a different evening. The next term we get here is suicide. And suicide is where an individual without a terminal illness causes his or her own death. And surprisingly, suicide is not illegal in the United States, but may be associated with penalties for those who attempt suicide. And it indeed is illegal uh, for people in the United States to assist with suicide. So those are two terms that are often mixed up with what we're talking this evening. What we're going to be discussing this evening is physician-assisted dying. And this is when an individual has a terminal illness uh, with six months or less to live, who is prescribed lethal medication by a physician that the patient can voluntarily take themselves uh, at the end of their life. And this is legal only in certain states. As we'll see, there are 11 states currently uh, where this is legal. And this is the focus of our discussion this evening, is physician-assisted uh, dying. We go to our next slide, please. Now, another similar uh, issue that comes up with both uh, Pat and Dr. Welter have told me about is voluntary stopping eating and drinking. And this is an option that people have even if they're on hospice. If they reach a point where they feel that they no longer want to continue, they can decide to stop drinking and stop eating, and that will usually lead to death in seven to 12 days or so, I imagine. Mm -hmm. It depends on the person. It uh, does depend on yeah. the person. And so uh, this is something uh, that people have a choice uh, to do in a variety of different environments. But that's just one of several choices. Let's go to our next slide, please. 
Another choice, uh, which our guests, both our guest speakers are here, are very knowledgeable about, is hospice care. And hospice care uh, focuses on the palliation of terminally ill uh, patients who have pain and their symptoms and provides for their emotional and spiritual uh, needs. And this is a very valuable uh, service uh, that is provided even at Cache Valley and throughout the country. And hospice prioritizes comfort and quality of life by reducing pain and suffering. And hospice care provides an alternative to therapies focused on life prolonging measures, which may be arduous, uh, likely to cause more symptoms or not aligned with the person's goal. It is covered under Medicare hospice benefits, and it's available for people who have less than six months to live uh, if the disease falls its natural course. And the goal of hospice care is to prioritize comfort, the quality of life, and the individual's wishes. That's a very important aspect, is that, as Pat has told me, and Matt has as well, the patient is the one who's in control in hospice care. And hospices typically do not perform treatments that are meant to diagnose or cure that illness, uh, but, and do not include treatments uh, that, that are for their illness. Uh, but they also do not participate in hastening death. That's not part of hospice care. Instead, hospice focuses on the palliative care for relief of pain and suffering. So here we can see, define some of the terms that we're going to be discussing this evening. Let's go to our next slide, please. So how is physician-assisted dying uh, done in Oregon and the other states that have approved uh, this procedure? Now, what we're getting here is there are certain control mechanisms that have been established to enable these laws to be approved by the states. First, the patient has to be clearly competent. And two doctors and two witnesses must assert that a patient's request for a lethal prescription wasn't coerced or under undue influence. Secondly, they must have less than six months of li to live, as indicated by a physician. They also have to wait 15 days before uh, filling the prescription to avoid impulsive decisions. So it's not something that happens fast. And physicians cannot administer the fatal dosage. They can only prescribe it. So this is something that patients have to be able to take themselves in order to complete under these uh, requirements. Now, how people argue this is there's two sides, like many things in our country today. But we're going to try to dis discuss how we feel about this issue uh, this evening. We go to our next slide here, please. Uh, the US Supreme Court, you think, well, how does it weigh in on physician-assisted dying? And the Supreme Court ruled that under the Constitution, uh, this right to privacy, which is a very important part of the Constitution, does not extend far enough to prohibit states from banning physician-assisted dying to terminally ill patients. Instead, what the Supreme Court did, which I think was very wise, they decided to leave it up to the states to solve this on their own. And the states are doing this one at a time in a gradual process. And as you'll see this evening, uh, speaking for my panel here, is we'd like to see this be an option in Utah as well. Let's see our next slide, please. So this shows you the states that currently have implemented laws for people to seek out physician-assisted dying in their states. And you can see the 11 states up there uh, as well. We were kind of talking among ourselves before the cameras began here that we first noticed that the states are kind of on the coastal areas. And then we find out we've got uh, Montana and Colorado and New Mexico, Utah is getting kind of surrounded by some of these states. And those are western states. And they felt probably they like the idea of having the liberty to make choices, which is one of the things we'll be talking tonight. And that's something that a lot of Americans want to have, to have choices of their own. Let's see our next slide, please. A very famous case that led to the passing of physician-assisted dying in California was the case of Brittany Maynard. And you can see what I have up here in the slide that describes her case. 
she had a particularly bad brain tumor that did not respond to therapy, was getting worse. She was a young woman, which brought a lot of attention to her case in California. And she couldn't obtain physician-assisted dying in California at that time. And the part that impressed me, and perhaps you as you read the story, is she decided that she was going to move to Oregon. Not just visit there, she moved. And her family moved there with her uh, to Oregon. They bought a house, the whole thing so that she could have that option and establish residency in Oregon, uh, which she did. And I like the quote here, she said, that she, something that I desperately want for myself at the end of my life. She wanted to have control of her death and to die among family and friends in her own house, in her own room, with people who cared about her. And she chose that option. And it was such a powerful case that the governor of California and the people, the voters of California, voted to have physicians dying made legal in California as well. You know, just one young woman made a huge impact. Next slide, please. So this is kind of what it looks like uh, of people dying in Oregon. And this is, as you'll hear me talk this evening, and my partners will explain what they think, to me this looks like a much more preferable environment than being in a hospital or a nursing home with wires and tubes and strangers around me. Now, Pat has told me I'll be very lucky if I can pull this off at the end of my <laughs> life, but I'm going to try very hard uh, to have something look like that uh, towards when I choose to die. It's Next slide, the cats. Yeah, the cats. I have cats, too. Now, one of the arguments that's often made against physician-assisted dying, is the slippery slope argument. And many of you have heard of this. And the slippery slope argument is that if we approve something like this that will hasten people's death, that would lead to a cascading effect that will get out of control. And that somewhere down the road, we'll start killing people involuntarily in the future, or people who aren't terminal. Well, the statistics don't bear this out. Let's go to our next slide, please. If you look at the statistics composed by Oregon over the years, uh, there are very few people who choose this option. Something about uh, four-tenths of one percent, so less than one percent of dying Oregons actually use this method to end their life. Now, the ones who do choose to get the prescription filled out for the lethal medication, uh, slightly just over a half of them, somewhere between 55 to 60 percent, actually do it. Uh, the other ones, for a variety of reasons, maybe change their mind, maybe they, it's not something they want to do, or they reach a point where they can't take the medicine themselves. Uh, they don't go down that route. So a lot of people say, oh, this is going to be a, something that gets out of control. But looking at the statistics here, we see that it's actually been doing pretty well. Uh, very few people do this. And a lot of people just like the idea that they have it as a choice. It's something that they can think, it, it, when times get tough, when I reach that point, when I've had enough, I have that option. And that's a very comforting thing for a lot of people. As we'll, If you watch the video, you see that very clearly. Let's see our next slide, please, here. Okay. So the first person we're going to have uh, open us up here, who's a very good conversationalist, is uh, Dr. Welter. And he's had a, a experiences with dying patients and even had experience with a couple who got involved up in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So I'll let Dr. Welter start us off here. So thank you. Um, yeah, and as I said, I've been dealing with hospice really my whole medical career, and it's, it's always been an interest. There's obviously a lot of time emphasized on helping people, making them better, curing their diseases, helping them cope with their diseases so they can live long and healthy lives. But medicine can only go so far, and all of us are going to die sometime, and you, you can't always prevent those things, but you can try to make it that when that comes to time that the person isn't going to be suffering for a long period of time, and, and you certainly want to keep them as comfortable as they can be, and to be on to die on their own terms, as he said, it's it's always terrible if somebody has to be 
dying, you know, in a nursing home with not a lot of help or, you know, dying with a lot of tubes and everything, things like that when, when it's not necessary. Now, sometimes it is. There's a traumatic quick event. You know, you can't plan for everything, but you certainly want to do that. And when I started in hospice, the attitude, and this was in the film too, was, you know, hospice can treat everybody. And we can control their pain. We can control all their symptoms. They can be at home until their, their death comes naturally and comes to an end. And that certainly was always my thinking early on. And, but one thing that I found was that over time, as I learned more about diseases and got more exposed and had more patients on hospice with a variety of diseases, is that it couldn't always. And there are people that had diseases that were very degenerative and disabling that despite the best efforts of what you could do in hospice, suffered a lot longer than they needed to until the end came. Um, the example in the movie they had of the woman with liver cancer certainly has played out. We've had numerous people on hospice with that. And they, they suffer. And they, they, they do find their end, but it's a very miserable end of wasting away, um, you know, becoming delirious as the toxins build up that we can't completely prevent. Uh, the pain and, and the family having to watch so I, I did become more interested in, well, couldn't we have done something sooner than this to maybe help them so they had a choice when they started to go down downhill like that, that they could have ended it there rather than having to go through the suffering that, that could take you know, months and months longer. Um, and so that became you know, uh, an interest of mine. Now, I have, haven't practiced in a state where it's legal, um, so certainly I couldn't have done those things actually, but um, a case came up that uh, he was talking about that involved Oregon, that really kind of cemented my thinking on it and said, you know, really all the states should have, have this Death with Dignity Acts. Um, they really should. And this case, um, was, it was some years ago, and a couple came in uh, in their mid-50s, and basically the wife had multiple sclerosis. And she'd had it for about 15 years, and she did all of the treatment she could. And unfortunately, they weren't working and they gave her really bad side effects that she couldn't tolerate them. I and they made her a lot sicker, and they didn't really control her symptoms. And she was getting at a point, they said, look, I don't know if we can really give you anything else. Nothing's working. And she was getting more symptoms. I mean, you know, multiple sclerosis can be a lot of things, but it can cause your muscles to spasm. It's hard to walk. Um, and she was fearful she'd eventually get where her mind got hazy. And she didn't have that, but she was very worried about that. And that's always a concern for a lot of people because then you really do kind of lose control of, of what happens to you. And so their questions were along those lines. Um, it took me a minute to realize that they were saying, well, what can we do because I don't want to last till the end with this. Um, and clearly this is Utah, and, and so I said, well, we can't do that here, but I understand hospice may not be appropriate, and she wasn't at a point where she really would be hospice appropriate. She would have to get far worse and to happen. So. I did say, well, you know, I have heard about Oregon and, and, and that you can go there. And part of it, um, you know, the case in California came. This was a little bit before that case, but there had been other cases of people doing that. And so I said, well, let me research it. And, and I did. And I called a physician up there, an internist who did it, and he explained a lot of what they needed to do. And so I told them that, um, kind of like the case, on what they would have to do to establish residency, about how long it would take, and to see the physician. Um, and what would happen with it. And I said, and that's, that's what we can do if this is your wishes. And they thanked me, and uh, I didn't see them for a while. Um, but what really hit me is about a year later, uh, he came back uh, just, just for a physical, but I said, hey, you know, how did, how did everything go? And his story was, was so touching because they got there, and they got established pretty quickly, uh, not rapidly, but fairly quickly. I uh, saw the doctor, and then, as he said, uh, you know, it's 15 days from when they established it. He saw two physicians, and, you know, they both agreed with all of the stuff we'd assembled for him for her disease so they could identify quickly that, yes, this is terminal. Um, and, and they were able to get the medications. And he said the, the sigh of relief in my wife when we picked up the prescription that she knew she had an option. She said, I now know I can do something about this. I'm not going to suffer till the end. And he said it was such a relief and a burden off of us that, you know, she didn't take it at the time. She said, well, I'm not quite ready yet. So we went around Oregon. We went to the coast. We did a lot of great things together. Um, they didn't have any kids or anything, so it was just really them. 
And then she just had a day when it got bad enough, she said, it's time. And, and the story of where we went there and I mixed up the, the pills and she took some nausea pills. We talked for about an hour or two while they kicked in. And then uh, she said, well, you know, I love you. We talked a little bit, she drank it and she just kind of fell asleep on my shoulder and about eight or nine minutes later, she quit breathing. Wow. And he said, I should feel horrible, but I felt so relieved and I obviously felt happy because she got to choose. And the way it happened and what could have happened was just so much better. I mean, it's almost tearful talking about how he misses his wife, but she went on her own terms. And that, and that touched me a lot to say, this is really something that as a physician we should have. We should have this in our, our ability for treating and, and it, it shouldn't really be illegal anywhere. And Oregon's done a great job of putting a lot of safeguards in there um, that weren't really present before that I think caused a lot of opposition. Um, you know, things from the time when Dr. Kevorkian in his day, oh, yes. who's very famous and people think of him, um, he started the conversation, but he did not have a lot of safeguards. And he did a lot of things that biased me initially on things of just not really proving somebody's terminal. Um, and, and people that were depressed but had diseases that may not harm them for five or 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he didn't have any safeguards in place. And, and because of that, a lot of people I think were opposed. And I think that was part of the initial opposing in Oregon was thinking of what he did. Um, even though he started the conversation and there were some positives out of it, what he did wasn't. And so, you know, with these kind of safeguards, I think most states can do this. And I, and I don't think, as he said, there, there's no proof of a slippery slope, no proof of euthanasia. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that people have to be able to take their own medicines and you have to prove that they're clear-headed, um, you know, is, is very much a, a good way to do it. And I don't think you're going to have those kind of problems. Um, there's obviously still room to work on. We've talked about, you know, what, what if you're worried about dementia? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what do you do? Because clearly, by the time you get to a point, you're not going to be as decisional. And I think that's a, a different question on things. But right now, they haven't addressed that because, you know, there's, that's got a lot of sticky pieces to it. Nice. it, it but they can be worked out. But that, that, that's one of those ones that I think a lot of people would like. But I, you got to work that out a little bit better, I think. Well, thank you. I was listening to him talk. I kept thinking that <clears throat> this problem has been building for some time. I mean, there are people that are having horrible deaths in places where they don't want to be, and they're trying to come up with an alternative. And you mentioned yeah. previous efforts, which were inept. Mm -hmm. And Oregon finally came up with a system that seems to be workable mm -hmm. and ethical and under control. And even with that increased interest, it's just a small number of people that are actually going that route and have the opportunity to use it. Mm -hmm. And I agree wholly with you that I think this should be something available in the repertoire that physicians have mm -hmm. to be able to use. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing uh, from the slides there <coughs> is that Oregon recently changed it that you don't have to have the 15-day waiting period. Um, California did too. If the physicians agree that you're not going to last 15 days, I did not know yes. that. Yes, uh, and they did change that because that was an issue, is that people would come and get it and they would die during the waiting period. Um, so they actually did change it. Now a physician has to say, yes, they, they are going to die in 15 days. Um, but they did, they did change that. Uh, I'm glad is, to hear that. Yeah, which is a, a nice little modification because that was an issue for some people. They were, you know, for cancer, they were doing great and all of a sudden they really start dropping off quickly. And being able to do that in that time, you know, because it, a lot of times they would die before they could even it's do like that. It's like Cody in the movie. Um, we were led to believe that she wasn't going to live very long after the relapse of her um, doing well. And uh, I don't think had she not taken the medicine to pass away um, when she did, she probably wouldn't have lasted two weeks. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. mm -hmm. She was at that point. So. Okay, yeah. well, I'm very glad to hear that they're Slightly modified. Slightly mo they're very slight <laughs> modification. Yeah. Slight modification. Mm -hmm. So, Pat, do you have something that you'd like to comment from your perspective? Well, I'm um, a, a big fan of hospice, of course. I've worked hospice for a long time. And um, I think hospice is fantastic for lots of patients that have terminal illness, but it doesn't work for everyone. And... Um, Really, they're probably a minority of uh, 
symptoms that we can't control well. Um, as, as Matt mentioned, um, we're pretty good at controlling a lot of the symptoms, but um, there are some things that we can't. And, and also um, some families don't want to follow direction very well. Um, and also patients, they don't, they don't like the effects of some of the drugs. So having a choice, I think, um, gives them the ability to make decisions on their own and, and live out the time they have left to the best benefit. Um, I thought, if you haven't watched the movie, it's um, pretty passionate to watch. Um, the, the main character through most of it is uh, this woman by the name of Cody, who is so dignified and um, so impressive, uh, just a, a beautiful human being. And she really thinks about her whole family and how she's gonna do this. She, she's inclusive with her physician um, and her friends and her coworkers. Um, she she kind of goes about it. And then she has a little bit of a reprieve from her symptoms and she does well for a little while and she says, well, maybe I don't need to worry about this right now. Um, and then of course, um, with her horrible diagnosis of liver cancer, she has a relapse that is quite uncomfortable and she makes a decision. So I think um, for me and for many people I am friends with, um, just having that option is a comfort. So probably much like the data presented um, in Oregon, um, getting the prescription filled and using it are still quite a ways apart. Um, I think uh, hospice is pretty extraordinary. We can handle lots of things, but there are also patients that aren't, um, as I was saying to Matt earlier, they aren't uncomfortable. They aren't in pain, they aren't nauseated, but they're really, really tired of living and they feel like they're at the end of the road, they have no purpose, they, their families, you know, were separated all over the country and, and they're saying, why am I still here? Why am I still here? And so they, I think some of those might have made that choice if they had that option. They were just tired. Um, they just didn't want to keep going. And we've had a year, a year to think a lot about death um, this last year. And I wonder um, when things settle down a, a little bit more from um, the effects of, of COVID, um, I wonder if we're gonna look at it a little differently because we've had, had to face that um, without that option um, and, and, and not have that out there and struggle to breathe, um, be on ventilators, and then, you know, have the end happen. So um, I, think, I think this would be wonderful if we have that option in, in Utah, in the state of Utah. I think it brings dignity um, to the end and the decision back in the ballpark of the patient. I would agree, obviously. Yeah. Yes. So one thing, since I'm in the middle, I'll kind of chip in here with my own point of view, is uh, my feeling about dying patients in hospitals kind of solidified very early in my career in laboratory medicine of all places. And I was surprised and ac actually quite concerned that when they had code blues in the hospital, they would send the laboratory people up there. And it was actually very vivid in my memory an elderly gentleman was in there and he was in cardiac arrest. They did the whole thing with a needle through the sternum with the adrenaline and uh, that didn't work. And the physician actually unscrewed the syringe from the needle and put a external uh, defibrillator through the needle to try to fire up this guy's heart. <laughs> and I was down there working on his, his blood system and finally the doctor said, has everybody had enough? And I actually was nodding my head. I'd had enough, and I'm sure the patient would not have liked what was going on either. It was a very brutal thing uh, to have at the end of your life. And so I, I've resolved very firmly, which I've talked about with my family, who are reluctant to talk about this, <laughs> is that I want to die at home. 
I do not want to die in a hospital. That, and I think most people in the audience probably know some people who's had a less than desirable death in a hospital or a nursing home. And I think if you ask most people, where would you like to be? You'd like to be in a place that you are comfortable. We were talking earlier about telemedicine as a way for people to be in a place where they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would like. And as I think about this goal, and I've watched the, the film and talked with my partners here, that requires some planning and some effort. And it requires a team support of your family to get that done. And so I'm going to keep working at my family and hope we all have that support and have this option. And being able to, I mean, one of the things that caught me in the movie <clears throat> with Cody is her oncologist said that she would come for the end of her life when she took her medication. But the oncologist didn't get off until 6 p.m. from the clinic shift. Cody said, I will wait until after uh, you're off your ship before I take this uh, lethal medication so you can be there. And I, I've thought about that. What would, what would it take to get all my family around me? That would take planning. And it's hard to do that planning with other options of dying. With physician-assisted dying, you have some control over the process of when these events are going to happen and who's going to be there and who's going to support you. And I feel very strongly I would like to have that as an option in Utah before I get to that state. Right now I'm healthy, but I can see in the future that everybody dies. And I'd like to have this as an option when this comes closer to my end. So. What do you think, Matt? No, I, I, I agree with that. And it's, yeah, it's not talked about enough. And families, a lot of times, yeah, are concerned that they don't know what the wishes are. And that's why people end up in the hospitals where you're like, well, I'm not sure why we admitted this person. You know, they, they have an illness, should, should then they be at home. But obviously, if they come in, mm -hmm. because the families haven't discussed it, they, they get more, when somebody gets more ill, they, they get worried and nervous. And that's fine. But they bring them in when they probably wouldn't have to if, because, you know, they're dying. And like I said, and some of that is just a discussion wasn't had. And when it is, on a medical standpoint, it's a lot easier for doctors to say, okay, this is, this is your wishes. They, they were very clear what they wanted. It helps us help decide it too. And it's a lot harder when people are trying to decide on the fly what to do. And it's a lot of pressure on a family to have to try to decide something like that. So... Discussing it is, is very important, and the fact you're doing that is, is great. Well, and also, um, often, families on hospice are saying, is it, is it close? Should I come visit? You know, tell me when, when it's time for me to be there, and that's such a hard guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to say how much time people have, even knowing, seeing them regularly, seeing them every other day, you can't second guess when they're going to take their last breath. Um, but families are asking that, and, and in this case, um, they could choose that day. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen very often without that option. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that, the ending of Cody's life, uh, to me, was kind of like, almost like a role model. I mean, there's somebody who had the dignity, and, and one of the things that was asked at a, a radio, uh, Utah Public Radio we were talking about today, is about courage. And you think, well, oh, you have the courage to continue with medical care, the courage to fight this illness to the bitter end, and that the courageous people have to suffer. That's one of the things you see with courage. I disagree with that. I mean, people can be courageous in many different ways, and I certainly think Cody uh, was courageous, and her physician reassured her that she was being courageous in what she was doing. She was doing things not only for herself, but her family. Mm -hmm. She wanted them to have an image of her that was in control, that was with her family, that was thinking about it. She was sharing jewelry and stories and writing letters and lots of things to, to give that gift of her parting to her family. And one of the things I was reading about the other day that I hadn't really thought about is if physician-assisted dying becomes more widespread, the families who attend those deaths 
are going to be very strong advocates. That's something that they're probably going to see in a new light and say, well, this is much better than what I've seen other people dying in a hospital. And they could be advocates in the future. So I think this process is going to continue to grow for that reason, that people are trying to avoid the very bad deaths in hospitals and nursing homes. And this provides a more dignified and in control process. Do you have any? Well, I think um, it's hard to label that, that stage with an adjective like courage. <laughs> yes. um, and I think it's, it's, it's an unfair expectation to, to put on a dying person, well, you have to be strong, you have to be courageous, you have to fight this. Um, you know, the, the lady in the movie, Cody, was such a powerful, uh, strong woman, such a dignified lady. Um, and, and who could ever say she gave up easy, you know, yeah. or she quit? or she was not courageous. <laughs> so I, I'm offended by those words. I understand, I understand how people mean them when they put them in the obituary, um, fought to the end. But, you know, I think that's a, a terribly unfair expectation mm -hmm. to put on, on patients and families mm -hmm. to have to do battle before they get to go. So. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of people, yeah, they, they feel like they're fighting for the family. And certainly I've had that where people have been through, well, this is my fourth round of chemo. I'm so nauseous. My hair is falling out. It's not really helping. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the family's like, well, you've got to keep fighting with this. And, they, and yeah. they don't want to, but they feel they don't want to look like a quitter. But you're not really a quitter. It takes a lot more to say, look, enough is enough, and I want to die on my own terms, and I don't want to die feeling like this, and, and, right. it, and it, it is difficult sometimes because their family will be on them about it. Saying, sometimes look, look, they yeah, do it yeah, for you, you, the yeah, family, yeah, that's Yeah, they're true. doing it for the family, and they're saying, well, you know, I, I don't want to give up because they're telling me not to give up, but you know, on the other side, the family's not the ones that are going through it and feel so horrible either. Not that they're bad meaning, but on the other hand, you know, mm -hmm. and I think they'd rather not do it. Right. So. Well, one of the things I've been trying with discussions with people that I know is you know the fact that we all die. Everybody's going to die. Hundred percent of people die at the end of their lives. And the important things, one of the big important things in life, is family and friends. And we were earlier talking about childbirth. I mean, childbirth is something that family and friends can participate. It's a bonding process, almost, if you will. And you think about weddings, another big event, where people come together and are supportive uh, to the people who are the center of the whole thing. And I'd like to see that same type of bonding and family and friends at the end of people's lives, where they come together to support that individual and the decisions that they're making. Right, right. I can say that um, I've attended quite a few deaths. Um, been there when it happened or, or minutes later or, or in process. Um, and it's powerful. It's very um, bonding. <laughs> it's really, really powerful. And I think many families would feel honored to be there. And the whole process is, um, for me, a little spiritual, that they've made that choice. They've finalized things with the family. They've kind of said their goodbyes. They've had their wishes honored. And, you know, as the hospice nurse, I would leave there thinking, wow, we did it right. It worked. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't always go that way. And when we can't always call the shots and we can't always anticipate what they're going to need. And we can't always figure out how it's going to be um, at the end. And so, um, as, as you said uh, earlier about being at the bedside, um, those memories are long for that family member, and so you want it to be as good as it can be, because they're going to remember that for a long, long time as their parting time. And and um, I think this is this is an option I would want is is just to have it out there, just in case.
So, and I agree um, with, with uh, even in hospitals, um, you know, you wish sometimes when somebody's there dying, because um, in the hospital usually they're a little bit maybe more out of it sometimes, but it is always sometimes heartwarming when you're there and you're sitting with the family and they'll tell stories, funny stories about the person and silly things they did. And you can hear about that. Yeah. Um, in some ways, once again, if you could be at home with that, and the person before they do it can be sharing the stories too, I think of even how more rewarding that is. Because I, I hear these stories, but sometimes I see the person at their end. Mm -hmm. you know, and they're there, and they're dying, you know, and they're older, and they're, they've wasted away. And you hear the stories of a vibrant person, and, and it would yeah. be... You know, I, I think it's a better way to remember someone some of the than, best than, deaths, than, than that. The be, some of the best deaths I have attended, they were in the last stretch, so to speak. Um, just the breathing had gotten irregular, and the family's all around, and there's quiet, and then there's a breath, and then there's little talking and telling a story, and and then they wait. and. You know, we we never know how long that will go on. It usually doesn't go on very long, but those were the most touching moments for me to witness, to see this family collected around this hospital bed. And the one I'm particularly thinking of was a very elderly woman. And everyone was on board. Everyone was there just waiting, just letting it happen. There was ultimate patience. Um, on their part, um, in one minute there would be tears in a story, and the next minute it would be humor in a story about something funny she said. So that's that's the best case scenario um, on a hospice death, um, mm -hmm. and it could be similar if it were death with mm -hmm. dignity. One of the arguments I often hear when this topic comes up is the topic of religion, and religion is a very powerful thing in our society. And people, quite often, who are very religious, uh, feel that it's people's duty to live as long as possible uh, because of a, it's, it's a gift that they're able to do that. And I'm a religious person myself. And my feeling is that having this as an option is something that would come at the limit of my life. The limit, the limit of life, no matter how you look at it. And like Pat has often said, you reach a point where you say, I'm done. And every morning I get up and say, well, there are things I have to do. And I can see in my mind there's a, there'll be a day when you said, I've done enough. I, I'm in pain, I'm suffering, I'm ready to call it quits. I've had enough. And I'd like to have this option. Now, for someone to say, well, in, in my religious beliefs, you shouldn't have that option. That's unfair. I mean, you, you're, everyone's entitled to their strong religious beliefs, and I'm certainly entitled to mine. But to say that my religious beliefs will dictate what can happen to other people, to me, is just simply unfair mm -hmm. and not just. So what do you think about that? No, I, I agree, and, and it, it is a personal choice, and everybody can do things how they want to, but... In a lot of ways, I mean, religious is, religion is a personal choice. And if you want to live that way, that is wonderful and that's fantastic. But that is your way and your connections to your religion, and it's not everybody's. And yeah, and, and, you, and you can't you know, put that on everybody because, uh, like I said, we've talked about these situations that you know, just allowing suffering just doesn't seem like it would match anything religious either. And I think you had the example of people and other things of life. If you have you know, a dog who's, who's, who's dying and is suffering, people don't feel terrible about the fact that you might put the dog to sleep, as, as heartbreaking mm -hmm. as it is, because you don't want them to suffer, or, mm -hmm. you know, or on a, you know, on a farm or something, a cow who's sick or something. It, people don't have any qualms about those kind of things, and I, you know, I don't always like to equate, you know, the farm animals to humans, but the, the theory is, is still the same, is that people, you know, yeah, you want to be in... I think I'm glad you yeah. brought that up because the emotions are the same. Yeah, the emotions are very much the same. Exactly the same. It's a different subject. But I love, if you've already heard me, I love my pets. <laughs> They're going to be That's there too I at the end. <laughs> I have the, the three cats <laughs> sitting on top of me. I have one that sleeps on me every night anyway. I wake up, he sits there. 
and so you know they're they're members of the family, and I, I I care about them as much, not as quite as much as my family, but they are a member of my family. But I think those emotions are just as strong, and I certainly have cried my heart out mm -hmm. uh, when some of my pets have passed, and I hated to see them suffering. I would hate more to see my family members suffering, mm -hmm. and I would love them more, and I would like them to have this this option as well. Mm -hmm. I. I've put pets down. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. It's heartbreaking. But, but I watched them suffer first, and, and I just thought, I can't do this anymore. So um, it's an interesting comparison. I had to put a cat down about three years ago, and, and I called the vet who came to the house, and I had the cat on my lap, and... She said, are you sure you want to do this? And are you ready? And I said, yeah, I'm ready. And she injected the cat, and I just petted, petted her, and, and she passed right on my lap. She didn't move. She didn't act scared. And, I mean, it was, it was so unbelievable. I just sat there next to this pet thinking, wow. We're so good to animals. <laughs> We're not always so good to people. That's a very interesting yeah. contrast there. I agree. Yeah. I mean, getting back into to humans, um, my own mother passed not too long ago. And she died in a, a nursing home facility. And she had indicated in writing how she wanted to go. And it didn't happen. And Pat has warned me about this. Sometimes you get things in writing you think they'll happen. And there were a lot of reasons why. And she died uh, in bad circumstances. Uh, she was demented at the end. And it was not at all how she wanted to, to pass at the end of her life. And at that time, they, they didn't have uh, physician-assisted uh, dying in California. I think she would have been, she was raised on a farm as well. Mm -hmm. Had some of the same beliefs that you mentioned about suffering around us. And she would not have chosen to go the way that she did. So I think, as, as Matt said at the beginning, uh, that we need to have this as one of the tools in the toolbox. Not everybody's going to choose it, but to have that option, to have the ability to put those pills in a drawer and say, I may or may not need them in the future, uh, is comforting to people. And I think it would comfort me as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, what I'm going to do is I will slide in right now, so I will rejoin the conversation. So thank you very much for the conversation, and it was it really, again, it, it's such an important topic, and it's, it's, it's sometimes difficult one to talk about. Uh, we do have some questions from our audience, so thank you for that. The first question is a question about resources. So are there resources available for family and friends to gain confidence and comfort in the process of physician-assisted dying for a loved one? So resources available for family I'll, and friends. I'll do a first one on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the, the video, How to Die in Oregon, mm -hmm. uh, the representatives of Compassion and Choices, mm -hmm. I think, volunteer to show up and help the families in Oregon. Now, what's happening in other states, I'm not sure, but I would guess again that they have almost like guides mm -hmm. that show up and show them how to mix up the medication, mm -hmm. how to take it, when, you know, and, and guide them through the process. And not only just at the end, but the counseling all the way along. I anticipate that's available. Mm -hmm. I think so. Mm -hmm. I'm not positive about that, but. It is in Oregon, yeah. I know. Yeah, because I, I think I, my. my my hunch is the intent of the question as well is for the counseling and not only the, the physical process of assisting in dying, mm -hmm. but the, the psychological process of assisting in dying. What, what I would like, this mm -hmm. is my vision, and, and Pat can answer this one, is if I, if I start to go downhill, uh, at-home hospice would be my first choice. Mm -hmm. And then I would try to use that service, which has very good counseling mm -hmm. available to them, and just never leave home. Mm -hmm. If I had to go to physician assist dying, I'd just stay there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing the film didn't demonstrate, which I, I kind of wish it had, um, and, and maybe it, it does this and it just didn't happen at the time the film was made, but um, it doesn't 
appear that any of those people were on hospice care at the end. And, and to me, those two things aren't in conflict. Um, and I'm not sure if that's part of the rule up there or if you don't need hospice if you have this. But hospice is a service that, that provides comfort in a multitude of ways. Um, so it's psychosocial comfort, um, comfort from pain, and comfort from stress and anxiety, and, and additional care. So it seems to me that the two would go well together if the hospice is having trouble controlling some symptoms on some patients. Mm -hmm. And if yeah. the patient had the desire. Yeah. And on, on, on their question there, it certainly, I think, it's available, you know, if people ask. I don't know if it will always be given. For a lot of hospitals, they're trying harder, and it's not, there's a big shortage of mental health professionals and people for this, unfortunately, but they try when people have terrible illnesses like this, that they try to set them up with a psychologist and things to work on dealing, how to deal with chronic illness and dying illness um, and the depressions and stuff that go along with it. And, and they've tried, they've made a much bigger effort to try. Now it doesn't always go, but there are some of those resources and there are, there are for people who, who want to talk about this. Like I said, on hospice, they certainly offer it, that, that is part mm -hmm. of what hospice does. But even before then, I mean, th th those are available. I will, I will confess that sometimes in the busy world of medicine, if people don't say, hey, I could really, I need some help with this, it may not just be given to them. Mm -hmm. So I would always encourage people, if there's questions about this, you know, at least make it a point to tell, ask your physician, hey, have, is there something I can get here? Because sometimes they don't always realize that, that, that you need that. And so, mm -hmm. so I'd always encourage people on that. But there's, they're trying to have that push. It's just, it's just not always easy because there's only so many, so many people out there that do it, unfortunately. So we need more. Yeah, I'm curious, Pat. This is not a question from the audience, but a question of, of mine. And, and that is, in your experience in hospice care, how many people, or what, what percentage of hospice patients that you work with would perhaps use physician-assisted dying? And I, I hate to you know, say, how many people do you think would benefit? Because this is a person mm -hmm, yeah, that yeah. decision the individual has to make. Um, you know, honestly, I, I don't feel like I encountered very many people that, huh. that had horrible ends of life. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, good for us, good for them, good for hospice. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a small slice. So... There are a lot of people who don't go to hospice. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and, I, um, and I think, you know, a lot of reasons for that. So, so one of the reasons is they had hospice support and they had the, the support of the team. Um, they had a physician that recognized their needs and, and provided the medications to keep them comfortable. They had family support or at least support in their caregiving. Um, those, those are all pluses that, that work towards the positive. Um, I think there are still some that fall between the cracks that don't land on hospice. Um, part of the problem with hospice, and, and this has gone on for over 20 years, is there's a great delay in referring. And so patients come to hospice, you know, you talk about the qualifier of um, fill the prescription and wait 15 days. Patients come to hospice and their life expectancy is very short and they don't even live two weeks um, on hospice. So um, we have a huge problem with getting people to recognize end of life and accept end of life and get the services they need. Um, they, we, we aren't good at anticipating mm -hmm. and it's not getting that much better. <laughs> yeah, they yeah, I think on that, I think the average is about, I think it's like seven or eight days of how long people are on hospice when they go on it and then when they mm -hmm. pass. So it's not, you know, mm -hmm. for a lot of people, yeah, like I said, they're almost on too late. I mean, yep. it's hard to get everything mm -hmm. set for them in that period of time. Now, sometimes it is a sudden illness and, and you can't yeah. avoid that kind of thing, but, yeah. but some of them are, well, maybe this should have been started. More often than early. not, yeah. it's a reluctance to, um, to seek help and and stop treatment, um, and to recognize that 
they are at end of life. So nobody has wanted to acknowledge that uh, this might be a, an opportune time to start hospice. Um, I've actually had at least a handful of patients that I went to admit them and they died while I was there I was on gonna, the first visit. <laughs> I was going to comment on that. My mom, at the end of her life, was in hospice uh, less than one day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very common and very sad. A, a completely unrelated question from one of our audience members is, is about faith traditions. And, and the question goes along the lines of that uh, you know, many leaders of faith traditions have declared that physician-assisted dying is incompatible with their Christian beliefs. Do any of you know how the LDS Church uh, views physician-assisted dying? I cannot say. I really don't know. I am not sure. I'm not LDS. I'm afraid I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do, do any of you have a sense, uh, and again, this is just sort of wild guessing, but, but where the Utah legislature might come on this? Has this ever been pushed towards the legislature? I would, I'd hate to predict what other people are gonna do. Mm -hmm. That's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. But I think anything that's new and different that involves death is gonna be controversial. Mm -hmm. And when you look at uh, legislatures and people in political office, controversial doesn't often go well with them. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not talk. sure they're gonna, mm -hmm take a running start at this. This is something the public has to push. And that happened in Oregon. The first time they passed this in Oregon, the legislature denied it going through. Mm -hmm. And they had another referendum that was even more people. Mm -hmm. And they finally listened to the voters in Oregon on the mm -hmm. second referendum. Mm -hmm. So that's something the people, I think, are going to have to push for. Mm -hmm. But I would say if people pushed for it, I think, in Utah, that certainly I think it would. For example, we have medical marijuana which in Utah you would think would be just an absolute, the last state in the union that would ever do something like that, and, given its and, other restrictions. And that was sold mainly by parents of children. So that was the, that was the ticket that really worked mm -hmm. and got to the legislature. So, so I think it, it will be, I think it's going to happen sooner or later. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's happening in the states around us. People in Utah and many of the Western states are real strong advocates of personal liberty. And this is certainly a choice mm -hmm. for personal liberty. Mm -hmm. So a question for you, Matt, is, is you spoke about different states and the particulars of legislation in those states. Mm -hmm. What would you, I mean, do you see things that, that look like mistakes to avoid? in laws that states have enacted and, and turning it around, uh, you know, what would be an, an ideal set of laws to, to regulate physician-assisted dying well, in Utah? Uh, you know, I, I will say that Oregon set the model. I mean, when you read through, it was really, really well thought out. And I think the other states, uh, from what I've, I've read of most of them, really followed their template yes. almost to a mm -hmm. T. Because I think it, it got rid of a lot of the controversies on things. Like I said, the, the Kevorkian uh -huh. issues, that, that honestly really set things back with that and really set a lot of things in place, you know, to be sure that you screen people for depression, uh -huh. you know, that, that, that because you don't, you don't necessarily want a depressed person to do this when they don't have a terminal illness and assessing these things to, to allay a lot of those, those concerns that were going on because that was one of the big ones with, with uh, Dr. Kevorkian was that he... There were people that were depressed, but they didn't really have a terminal illness, and he did it anyway. And then obviously he was the ultimate, when he finally got caught, uh, was when he did the slippery slope, when he got caught injecting somebody. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. Which it's was, euthanasia. Youth, which is euthanasia, which then, then he went on a murder trial for that. Mm -hmm. And and so and so he, he did that, and that really soured people a lot to it. But I, the Oregon's laws, and really all the other states follow this, really, really have a lot of guidance in there. Mm -hmm. But on the physician side of things, they're good because they don't overburden you with things. They, they, they put a lot on the physicians to say, you guys can do this and we're not going to sit there and stand over you, you know, with all kinds of administrators watching it. I mean, and their law is very open to how physicians can interpret it. Like the 15 days, they said, let the physicians determine it. Your, yeah. your residency and you're there in Oregon. They say the physicians can choose it. Now, if they're doing something really goofy, It'll, it'll show, but they don't. But they say, you guys have to feel that they're an established resident, mm -hmm. and that's really on the physician you know, to do that. And it's not a burden. That just says, we will keep out of your hair, and you guys can, can determine this without us trying to make these preset rules. Because 
you know, like you've talked about, there's a lot of illnesses out there that don't play by the rules. And, and you, can't, you can't set these, you know, checklists down all the time. And some because, are very unpredictable. Yeah, they're, they're extremely mm -hmm. unpredictable. And so you can't, you can't set checklists like that. And, and their law is very good that you can't do that because there's so many different situations and it lets you adjust to it. Which and I think, didn't Oregon change the, um, the rule on residency and make it shorter? I, I noticed in the case of Brittany Maynard, I looked at this very closely, is she got her residency somewhere around five to six months. But she had to have a driver's license, she had to have a home in Oregon, that's why they bought the home. Mm -hmm. And she had to be there for a while. So I, I think there are some, you just can't just go up there. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to establish themselves to the state's mm -hmm. definition of residency. Mm -hmm. Which, once again, was a very good safeguard because yeah. Oregon didn't want people coming from all totally over don't. to be there for you know one week and, and do this. And so, right. once again, a very good established rules on things. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think we're running out of time, and what I want to do is is thank each of you. So thank you, Matt. Thanks, thank Andy. You. And thank you, Pat, for this again, important Thanks. discussion. I also want to thank uh, my colleagues in the College of Science who have really made this possible. I want to thank Utah Public Radio, and last but certainly not least, I want to thank USU Media Productions, who, uh, you know, without them, uh, the show wouldn't go on, wouldn't even start. So, <laughs> thanks very much, and I want to thank the audience too for attending. And uh, this is a special BYU USU football night for those of you who are here. <laughs> you were very committed, so thanks a lot, right. and good night. I'll add before before is, we go. If you feel the urge, feel free to contact your state representatives about this. This is something the state <laughs> mm -hmm. has to do. It's not a federal government, but the state of Utah. So feel free uh, to contact your representatives. Okay, thanks very much, and thank you. Good night. Thank, thank you. you.